Anna, we are live. Over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session, Building Inclusive, Resilient, Gender Equal Societies Through Comprehensive Sexuality Education. I'm Anna P. Santos, and I will be your moderator and host for this panel. First of all, I'd like to open this panel by asking all of you who are here for a quick question. And if I may please ask our tech people to kindly flash these slides with this question. What kind of sex education did you get when you were younger? I still remember when I was younger, the kind of sex education I got could be summarized by these cue next slides. When you're dry, the sperm will die. When you're wet, a baby you will get. That was one kind of sex ed I got in the class, one sex ed lesson. The other was, please flash next slide. Close your legs and pray. <laughs> I wish I could see all of you now, but I can imagine that some of you are laughing. Some of you remember that you got this similar kind of sex ed, or it sounds so familiar to you. So I'm hoping that this is familiar. And also, you know, it can help us remember and think back to the question now, what kind of sexuality education do you actually wish you got? Can we go to that last slide? And that is exactly the question. This, what kind of sexuality education do you wish you had or you wish you got? That's exactly the question that we posed to over a thousand young people between the ages of 15 to 24 across the Asia Pacific region. And that is the results of that survey is what we're going to be presenting today. Um, after that presentation of these results, it's actually the first time that we've asked such a large cohort of young people about their satisfaction levels with a comprehensive sexuality education that they're getting in school. And so it's going to be a great uh, time and opportunity for us to hear the, the feedback of young people. After that presentation, which is going to be presented by um, uh, Program Officer Brian Gonzalez of IPPF, we're going to hear from panelists across the region about best practices and um, other, other examples of how comprehensive sexuality education was implemented in their respective countries. All right. So before we go into that presentation, let me just please run through some house rules. Okay, so sex is hard to talk about any age. So we hope to really make this forum a safe space where all questions, all points of clarification will be, can be asked and answered with respect and care. This is a great opportunity where young people are brought together with experts and educators. So we hope that this is a safe space where we can close the intergenerational gap between the you know, young people and educators and experts uh, because we all want the same goal. We want to empower our young people with, in, with information that they need so that they can make empowered, informed choices about their bodies so that they can own their future. Other house rules, please. Um, there is going to you can please type in any questions that you have in the chat. We have um, our moderators, co-moderators monitoring the chat, which um, will will take our questions later. And from there, we can go on to our panel for today. I'd like to start with. 
a video now. Remember, we had a question, what kind of sexual, comprehensive sexuality education do you wish you got? Okay, we're going to open with this video that answers the question, what exactly is comprehensive sexuality education? You know, what are we really talking about when we say CSE and how can it impact young people's lives? These videos were produced by the UNFPA Asia Pacific with contributions from UNESCO and IPPF E-S-E-A-O-R. Maybe please roll that video. What is comprehensive sexuality education and how can it impact young people's lives? Comprehensive sexuality education, sometimes simply called CSE, is a white space and gender transformative approach to sexuality education. All young people will have to make life-changing decisions about their relationships, sexual and reproductive health, and well-being. CSE empowers young people with the knowledge, attitudes, and the skills they need to strengthen and protect their health and well-being, and in turn, to respect others. For CSE to have positive impact, lessons have to be gender responsive, be taught from a young age in an age-appropriate manner, and encourage critical thinking. I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, it was, there's some really good salient points there about what comprehensive sexuality education is, which emphasizes that it really encourages also critical thinking in young people. So in that way, it will empower them to think ahead about the choices that they make when it comes to their reproductive health and sexuality health rights. Uh, I'd like to introduce now for our welcoming and opening remarks, Ms. Tomoko Fukoda, who is the Regional Director of the International Planned Parenthood Federation, East, Southeast Asia, and Oceania region. Tomoko is currently based in Kuala Lumpur and has spent more than two decades leading advocacy efforts on sexual reproductive health and rights, including as part of UHC and for the discussion at the G7 and G20. Tomoko, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Anna, and a warm welcome to all our participants and viewers who are uh, watching this on the Facebook live stream. Um, I think we are all here because we believe that as adolescents transition through to adulthood, they need to be equipped with the necessary knowledge, attitude, decision-making skills to support their health and well-being regardless of their age, their sex, their socioeconomic status, um, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, um, all the diverse circumstances that young people may find themselves in. And uh, we are all strong believers that comprehensive sexuality education is what enables young people to have those knowledge and skills. Um, but I think we also uh, understand that there is a strong opposition towards uh, comprehensive sexuality education. The terminology sexuality may be misunderstood. Um, there may be uh, people who think that CSE will encourage sexual activity before marriage, which would not be accepted in society. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions around CSE. Uh, we also realize that in the world today, young people are bombarded with a full load of information that we didn't have, or I didn't have uh, 30 years ago when I was a teen. Uh, the internet has in information around all the different uh, things around sex or sexuality that we would have never been able to come across. And these do shape how young people think uh, and the maturity of young people these days are accelerating with all that information being there. Uh, so being able to be informed at the right age, being aware of 
all the different options ahead of them uh, is becoming critically, critically important. But we do have a big challenge ahead of us. Uh, we also experienced the COVID pandemic in the last two years uh, globally. So I have some data in front of me. Uh, globally, 93% of the countries closed their schools fully or partially by the end of March 2020. Uh, with, in Asia Pacific, it was 90% of the countries, and it was 3.1 million institutions that closed down during the pandemic. And this disrupted education of more than 1.2 billion students. Uh, so this is a large group of people, and two years is a long time where formal education was disrupted. Uh, we were not also able to reach our young people in uh, out of school settings as well with limits to movements and uh, people together. Uh, but I think this COVID pandemic has also propelled us or forced us to move into a new era where we make use of all the digital technology uh, that is here with us. I think the COVID pandemic has also shifted our eyes to look at more the population who is left behind because COVID did push people more into poverty. Uh, there was more uh, staunch uh, marginalization, access to services become, became much more challenging for those who were already in challenging situations. So I think the COVID pandemic has really pushed us into really thinking deeper into our societies, understanding the intersectionalities of how discrimination can play out and affect our societies. So I'm equally excited as all of you as we uh, venture into this uh, session today. I, I really hope that through the discussions from young people and then through the interactions that you will have, you will think about how can we not leave anyone behind in the strive to ensure young people have these knowledge and skills. What are the different learning modalities that we can offer? Uh, what are the supportive environments that are necessary? How can we ensure that young people have the services to enable their decisions or their, their thoughts? How can we work across the different sectors? Not just the health, but education and also youth and sports. You know, there are many different actors who work with young people. How can we work together, collaborative across these sectors? Um, so this, I hope this session will help us to shape a little bit more our thinking. And I really look forward to this uh, session together with the rest of you. Thank you. Back to you, Anna. Thank you so much, Tomoko. I think you highlighted a lot of realities about comprehensive sexuality education, which is one is that there's always a lot of pushback against it because of certain thoughts or, or perceptions about how it could actually push um, irresponsible sexual behavior among young people. But I think we have some evidence here that's going to show us that it won't. And also you brought up how the pandemic has pushed more young people out of school. And this is usually the place of delivery for, for comprehensive sexuality education. But all of these things present also opportunities for us to, to actually digitalize or modernize the way that we are going to um, deliver comprehensive sexuality education to our young people through various settings that they find themselves in. Thank you, Tomoko. I'm now going to introduce two of our panelists today who are going to present to us the presentation of key findings. This is a survey across over a thousand young people across the Asia Pacific region about what kind of sec comprehensive sexuality education do they wish they would actually get. And I'm to, to introduce the, the survey and present its findings, we have Bryant Gonzalez, who was the senior product uh, program officer for young people and comprehensive sexuality education for IPPF, EAESEAR. -E and we also have 
Brian Kironde from the UNFPA Pacific Office. I'll turn it over to you, Brian and Brian. Thank you, Anna. Okay. Can you share my screen? Um, can you share the presentation, Secretariat? Okay. So good morning, everyone. So I'll be I'll be speaking um, about the status key findings from the status of um, um, status of comprehensive sexuality in the Asia Pacific region. Um, it is a review which was done in 2020, um, and we completed the review um, last year. We where we where we launched uh, together with UNFPA. Um, and UNESCO. Next slide, please. So this is um, the outline of our presentation today. Um, I'll talk briefly about the review um, and then what is comprehensive sexuality education and some key findings uh, from this review and also um, the monitoring and evaluation of uh, CSE in the Pacific. Next slide, please. So in, in 2019, UNFPA, UNESCO, and IPPF, ECOR collaborated for a regional review on the status of CSE in the Asia and the Pacific region. There were 30 countries um, involved in this study. Uh, 21 are in Asia and nine are in the Pacific. So the review is informed by an in-depth um, literature review. Next slide, please. As well as survey responses um, and promising practice case studies from country representatives, including staff um, from each ministries of education or equivalent and UNESCO and UNFPA country offices and IPPF member associations. Next slide. The review also included a rapid um, online survey with CSE experts in respective country. This was done to better understand and compare findings exclusively on sexuality education topics covered and the comprehensiveness of the curriculum. An online youth survey and focus group discussion on sexuality education. Next slide, please. Uh, were conducted by UNFPA. Uh, this is what Anna um, has been telling us as well. Uh, in order to understand young people's experience, experiences with sexuality education in the Asia and the Pacific. So information from these sources were consolidated to present a summary of sexuality education, including relevant laws and policies, curriculum development and content, and teachers' preparedness. So I'll be sharing the key findings um, in the next slide. Next slide, please. So CSE is a curriculum-based and learning, curriculum-based process of teaching and learning about cognitive, emotional, physical, and social aspects of sexuality. The aim of CSE is to equip children and young people with the knowledge skills, attitudes, and values that will empower them to realize their health, well-being, and dignity, develop respectful social and sexual relationships, consider how their choices affect their own well-being and that of others, and understand and ensure the protection of their rights throughout their lives. According to the International Technical Guidance on Sexuality Education, or ITGSE, School-based school CSE programs should be implemented alongside support and involvement from teachers, parents, training institutions, and youth-friendly health services providers. Next slide. So many countries globally have policies or strategies indicating support for sexuality education. 
but few have implemented or sustained large scale CSE programs. Government structures and education systems, national laws and policies, as well as social cultural norms are all factors that may influence whether and to what extent CSE is provided. So a total of 28 countries have at least one national law, policy, or strategy referring to the provision of sexuality education for young people. And in the Asia Pacific region, there are two countries that have mandated the provision of sexuality education by law, um, which is um, Philippines and Thailand. Next slide, please. Most countries have policies and strategies developed by national level education and health sectors that highlight the importance of ensuring young people are equipped with information regarding sexual and reproductive health. Um, there were 20 countries reported that they were aware of relevant national law or policy or strategy in place. Next slide. And across Asia and the Pacific region, there are 19 countries that reported that government funding is allocated specifically towards sexuality education in their country. And most countries reported that this was within the, within the Ministry of Education budget. Next slide, please. In terms of the delivery approach, so based on the survey responses, Countries that have mandatory or optional sexuality educational education curriculum are fairly evenly split across the Asia Pacific region. 16 out of the 28 countries surveyed reported that sexuality education is mandatory for primary level students and 15 out of the 28 countries reported the same for secondary level students. Sexuality education should be comprehensive in its content and reach a wide audience. When sexuality education is optional, uh, that is, that is um, only taught in, informally outside of schools or as an extracurricular subject, a significant number of young people may miss the opportunity to access sexuality education and information. Having a mandatory sexuality education curriculum through schools is therefore imperative to ensure the wider reach of youth population. Next slide. The MOE survey suggests that sexuality education is most, mostly thought as an integrated subject in the Asia Pacific region. Of the countries, survey sexuality education is integrated with other um, mainstream subjects such as science, religion, physical and health education in 16 countries, in primary level school, in primary level education, and in 19 countries in secondary level education. So sexuality education may be taught as a standalone subject dedicated to sexuality education or mainstream or integrated with other um, mainstream subjects. When CSE is taught as a standalone subject, more time can be focused on sexuality education and it is easier to monitor and evaluate its effectiveness. However, this may require more time and resources to develop and implement and it may be vulnerable to being discontinued or overlooked compared to other school curriculum. While integrating sexuality education with existing subject may be more cost effective and readily acceptable by parents and community members, time and resources spent on providing sexuality education may be limited due to competing priorities. Integrating the, the Sexuality education may also require training a large number of teachers across different subjects, and thus more, most teachers may have inadequately taught to properly integrate CSE. Next slide. So countries in this review were also asked when sexuality education is introduced in schools 
and whether it is provided throughout schooling year. So in approximately half of the countries um, that, was, uh, that, were served, that was surveyed, aspects of sexuality education are introduced in the first grade of primary school or earlier. In some countries, sexuality education is, is not introduced until grade six or above. The International Technical Guidance for Sexuality Education recommend that sexuality education begin as early and be as comprehensive as possible in childhood. Reaching children with age-appropriate sexuality education as early as possible is vital to ensure that they have accurate information and necessary decision-making skills concerning their health and relationships. Children should receive age-appropriate sexuality education from age five years or earlier and before the onset of puberty and sexual activity. And education should continue throughout adolescence and adulthood. Next slide. So the, the content of sexuality education varies greatly in the region and by country as diverse societies, cultures, and religion, as well as national health and socioeconomic issues play a big role in what is considered to be a priority and appropriate to include in, social, in school curriculum. The international technical guidance recognizes the diversity of different national contexts in which sexuality education is taking place. And consequently, what is included in curriculum is ultimately the responsibility of each country. So at the primary level, sexuality education topics covered in the curriculum and how extensively they are dealt with varies by country. The commonly topic reported in the survey as being covered in the curriculum at the primary level included puberty, HIV and AIDS, STIs, love and relationship, gender and gender norms, and sexual abuse and violence. Compared to the primary level curriculum, topics covered in the secondary curriculum are more diverse and are reportedly taught more extensively. While puberty, HIV, and STIs continue to be taught from primary through to the secondary level, there is an increase in the number of countries that introduce other topics at the secondary level, including pregnancy and birth, contraception and marriage. Next slide. In the, CS, um, in the survey, we also asked experts, um, experts uh, to indicate their comprehensiveness of their sexuality education in the country at the primary and secondary um, level of education. And nine countries reported that their primary level education was comprehensive and 16 reported that, in, that it is not comprehensive, that it is comprehensive in the secondary level. So majority of CSC experts do not think that sexuality education were comprehensive in their country. Can you go to the next slide? Maybe we could proceed to the teachers training and support. Next slide, please. I could talk quickly and uh, next slide. Okay. So there, nearly there are two thirds of countries reported that training for teachers in sexuality education is provided um, and 23 countries reported that resources and teaching guidelines are available for teachers. So in order for sexuality education to be successfully delivered, teaching, teachers training is essential to ensure accurate and quality education is delivered in safe environment. Teachers should feel adequately prepared and supported to teach sexuality education and have access to materials and resources. However, countries noted that there are challenges faced in providing sexuality education due to concerns regarding parents and community member views, as well as personal discomfort. Next slide. Uh, 
As part of delivering effective CSC program, pilot testing of curriculum is recommended to ensure flexibility of content and considered feedback from participants. So most countries reported that their national sexuality education curriculum has been piloted before implementation and evaluation. So my colleague from UNFPA, Brian Caronde, a UNFPA specialist on adolescent and CSE, will talk about the monitoring and evaluating CSE in the Pacific. So Brian, over to you. Thank next you very slide. much, Brian. Um, could you please go to the next slide? Okay, next one. So um, we've taken lessons from this uh, and recommendations from this uh, survey. Next slide, please, Theo. And uh, we've uh, focused this into what we want to do in the Pacific as a response to strengthening monitoring and evaluation for CSE. This is usually what we always think about uh, the latter stages of uh, CSE work. The reason why I'm sharing this here is for us to start thinking about at the beginning stages of the design and uh, rollout of the CSE work so that we don't leave the M and E part to the end. Next slide, please. So, um, what we've done in the Pacific is uh, this slide simply uh, says the story that CSE work, integration of CSE within uh, in school, as well as development of CSE for out of school has very many processes. We, always, we often make the mistake of thinking it's whether you have sexual education at the beginning and at the end, whether it is being rolled out and not take uh, cognizance of the processes that are involved in there between. So most of our evaluation measures of success uh, only ask, does, does a country have, or does a, does a, does a, does a, a community have, or does it, is it rolling out and uh, without uh, taking recognition of this? So what we've done in the Pacific is break this down and make sure that we create milestone indicators that can help us to take uh, credit for all the processes that are very heavy across the board for both in school, the upper axis of that, uh, 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 that, that, that plan and uh, out of school to demonstrate the changes that happen and, uh, and, and how to take stock of those at every stage. Let's, let's go to the next slide, please. So um, in 2020, uh, our colleagues uh, from UNESCO helped the development of the revision of the sexual education and review and analysis tool uh, by releasing version 3.0. Basically, it's a tool that any country can use any stakeholder within in school to assess how they are progressing on the implementation of comp comprehensive sexual education. It primarily focuses on the objectives, the principles, uh, you know, the, the, the content that has been included right from the earlier age groups to the uh, in primary or lower, 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 lower secondary to the uh, higher age groups. Um, the integration uh, procedure processes, uh, how the teaching is delivered, learning approaches, uh, teacher competencies and teacher development that may exist. And of course, anything that has to do with the legal environment to support CSE. So considering that, next slide, please. We went ahead in the Pacific and contextualized the uh, 2020 version of the sexual education and review assessment tool so that it fits the Pacific context. Why? Because uh, not everything in there can easily be applied to the Pacific. So the first and most important thing is we developed a monitoring and evaluation framework specific for the Pacific. And this is entirely theory based. It's in theory based and has five data collection mechanisms that uh, move, that include checklists, uh, referral systems, because at the end of the day, when young people get knowledge from the classrooms, we need them to be able to uh, uh, access services and use those services. Uh, knowledge on, you know, uh, assessment on knowledge or change attitudes, change practices, uh, you know, existence of data 
own CSE within the health management information systems, and then including data that we can pick from the existing uh, population-based surveys, like uh, household surveys, like uh, demographic health surveys, and uh, and population and housing statistics. Now, the theory of change was, of course, guided by our own UNFPA uh, gu guidance that we, we, we developed, as well as uh, complemented by the logic framework within this, you know, the CERAT. Um, the, the framework uh, has, is based on a couple of indicators uh, that come from the CERAT, but we complemented that with the KEO validation scale. The KEO is basically a measure of knowledge change that we can see if it's being taught in a classroom, how much knowledge is being acquired. So we can be able to assess that. And uh, we also include longer term outcome indicators that we see that are really have already been included in the, strategy, in, the, in the sustainable development goals and some of the specific ICPD related uh, uh, indicators. Next slide, please. So going ahead, the framework in itself is a proposal. And this proposal is to be taken to each of the Pacific countries. And it's something that uh, for us is a lesson on how other regions can also be able to uh, uh, unpack or contextualize the uh, monitoring and evaluation using existing guidelines and, 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 and tools. So we use this uh, because the, in our in case, the, our m &E framework is to help us continuously monitor CSE, unlike the CERAT, which is designed to be done intermittently and retrospectively um, uh, after a certain periods of time. So it's based on the monitoring and evaluation um, approaches that include data that has to be there, indicators included in education information systems, and the capturing of you know continuous incremental indicators. Next slide, please. So. The slide here just shows the sample theory of change that we have, which basically communicates concepts from inputs that have been made from program level to outputs and eventually to the impact. What I can say briefly on this page is we 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 do everything under in you know CSE. Ultimately, we need to see a change in behavior, health-related desired behaviors that we want to send young people. And those that can eventually now lead us to seeing uh, reduced, for instance, uh, pregnancies and uh, more respectful relationships through that uh, gender uh, equality uh, uh, strong. Uh, we also go to the next slide, which uh, includes an M and if uh, matrix framework based on still the same concepts across that whole span of the theory of change from program output up to impact level. Now, last slide here is talking about next slide, please. What we what we need to do after we've done this, and this is what we're also proposing. There is an intention and there's a plan, and it's imperative that we uh, contextualize this theory of change to countries. That's where we move from being theory-based to now practical. There's an intention to ensure that we align the data sources within the m e framework to na existing national man data management systems, uh, working with uh, curriculum developers to integrate checklists into syllabuses that are being developed and any other tools. Uh, developing, piloting, and refining tools on, on you know, different you know, knowledge-based surveys and such things. Then lastly, integrating this and making sure that it, it works and talks to also out of school work. Thank you very much. And I'll hand back over to Brian. Thank you, Brian. Um, next slide, please. So just to continue on meeting the needs of young people on CSE, in the youth online survey, we've asked young people, how do they feel about the sexuality education they receive from school? And the survey suggests that 28% of young people felt that, young, that school taught them about sexuality very well and somewhat well. Next slide. So satisfaction with sexuality education was even lower among um, the LGBT, young LGBT groups at 15% and respondents with disability compared to the general youth population. General youth, yeah. Next slide. 
And we've also asked um, young people um, what are their preferred or more preferred sor uh, sources of information about sexuality. And the survey indicates that the internet um, and their peers were the more preferred sources of information about sexuality than schools. Next slide. So we have also asked young people um, about the use of um, digital media to explore sexuality or seek information on sexuality. So nearly half uh, of 15 to 18 years old respondents who have used digital media to explore sexuality or seek information on sexuality by gender um, says that 47% have used social media and watched um, pornography and nearly a third of the 15 to 18 years old have experiences um, sending, receiving, and sharing um, of sexual, sexually explicit uh, photos, text messages, or videos. So young people now are more connected um, than ever on, on, on social media. And 15% um, of those use uh, dating apps um, was also reported. Next slide. So in conclusion, the approach towards sexuality education within the Asia Pacific region um, varies immensely from the terms used uh, to refer to sexuality education, to its content and delivery, and the level of priority in national educational setting. Most countries integrate uh, some sexuality education topics in core subject, and many many focus more on life skills and family life education. Despite existing policies and strategies relating to sexuality education and sexual and reproductive health in many countries, in reality, the implementation of sexuality education is limited and poor quality in many countries. This can be due in part to cultural and religious norms, limited resources for curriculum development, and teachers' training. It is apparent that important progress and commitments are being made in many countries in Asia and the Pacific region in developing and implementing sexuality education for young people. A number of gaps and opportunities remain, however, in further strengthening the design and implementation of CSE in the region. And I'd like to quote a young person in one of our focus groups uh, saying, that I think sex education is important for young people like me because we tend to be curious. And if we are not educated properly, our curiosity could be dangerous. Next slide. Just quickly, we have um, developed um, a summary review report and five fact sheets. Uh, the link of them will, the link um, will put it in the chat. You can download it and learn more about the regional review. Next slide. And we've also developed um, with UNFPA and UNESCO videos um, about CSE. So you could um, also see those videos in the link that we'll provide later. Yeah, next slide. All right, and next slide. Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you very much, Brian and Brian, for presenting to us the survey of, of the survey of how comprehensive sexuality education is being carried out in various countries, and also what young people think about delivery of CSE in their countries. I noted, Brian and Brian, that there was only 28% of the respondents who said that they found their comprehensive sexuality education taught in school as being taught very well or well. That presents a huge opportunity still for us educators and, and young people to come together to close this gap. But I think what I kept on also hearing was, what do we actually mean by comprehensive when we talk about sexuality education? It's so much more than what we, I received before about just closing your legs and praying. There was a lot of emphasis on critical thinking, respect for others, 
and healthy relationships just also beyond just the biological aspects or the physiological aspects of of sex and um i think also another glaring point was where our young people are are going to get information about sex their sexuality and as that slide the last slide that you showed Brian, you know you're inherently curious so where are you going to go to get information about sex and sexuality? And they go more and more into the internet. And there's a, there was a, your particular slide talked about um, accessing information about pornography, sexting, going on dating sites. And I think this is also an area where we can talk about um, the information that young people need also when they, when they explore in these platforms and how to do it safely. For, for that, we actually have a video about how comprehensive sexuality education can encourage respectful relationships in the digital age. I'm going to ask you to please cue that video. It has a real life scenario about two young women and how they're navigating sexuality in their youth and how comprehensive sexuality education can actually help them. Comprehensive Sexuality Education, or CSE, encourages respectful relationships in the digital age. Meet two teenagers Anna and May, attending school in two different countries in the Asia-Pacific region. Anna does not receive comprehensive sexuality education while May does. Age 14, Anna has a crush on a boy in her class. They start seeing each other after school. He pressured Anna for kisses and asked for sexy photos. Anna feels uncomfortable, but she sends some photos because she wants him to like her. Soon, Anna's pictures appear on social media and are seen by her classmates. She's teased mercilessly and she can't focus on her lessons. She falls behind in school and she feels isolated. On the other hand, Macy's E classes taught her about the dangers of sharing sexually explicit images that can end up on social media and cyberspace. Open communication at school and at home has taught me that genuine relationships are about respect and love, with both partners protecting and trusting each other. The two, the two um, protagonists in the video, one was named Anna, that was not based on me, just to let everybody know, but I was thinking about how familiar those scenarios still are. I thinking about when I was a young person and how I wished I could navigate relationships that I wanted to explore at that time. I think a lot of those scenarios still look familiar or feel familiar to us, no matter what age we're watching that video in. Thank you very much for sharing that. You can share those videos. Um, those links are available and you can spread, uh, uh, share those videos across your different platforms as well. Now I'm going to introduce uh, panelists from the different countries who are going to present scenarios specific to their countries. There'll be different scenarios that we're going to talk about. And our first um, panelist will talk about how they were able to build comprehensive sexuality education into their national education curriculums. So this is actually a, an example of a best practice out in Cambodia. For this presentation, we have Dr. Somi Safron, who is a Reproductive Health Association, who is with the Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia or RHAP. She's currently working as a program manager of research and advocacy, reproductive health, and, um, and reproductive health. She has over 15 years of working in the research field and communities. Dr. Somi, so, Dr. Somili is strongly passionate about continuing her research field, particularly in using gender, the gender lens to reflect on Cambodian social context. Dr. Somili? Yes. Thank you very much, Anna. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having Ra as a part of sharing successful implementation related to CSE. Uh, you can see the slide, right? Uh, see. Yes, please go to the next slide. 
yeah, allow me to brief the situation in Cambodia that we can consider as a starting point of considering the CSE in the local level. Around 1990, HIV AIDS were considered as epidemics and Cambodia was uh, one of the country that had the highest HIV prevalent rate in Asia, especially among the young people. This situation urged the multi-stakeholder to support and fight against HIV AIDS, which uh, including the commitment of the government funding from the international donor, international and national NGO who work to promote the health sector together. And of course, RA is one of the active agency who have been fighting against HIV at that time. And at the first time, we start to develop youth, uh, health, youth health programs starting from 1997 in Pasianuk province, which is located in the coastal area. And it is the, <clears throat> the tourist province that was known as the high prevalent HIV at, aid at that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that start to raise uh, awareness and educated people in the community on how to prevent HIV AIDS. Then the topics brought them to STD and later on uh, we talk more about safer sex and life skill and uh, negotiation skill. Next slide please. The story from uh, about uh, they would threaten us with gun, but uh, we kept on talking. Uh, was an example of the challenge that was working to prevent HIV AIDS at that time. Through uh, we provide a service for the voter around 1997. Besides that, we commit strongly to promote education by producing education kits, kit and aim to inform the primary public and secondary student about HIV AIDS pre prevention and continue to implement the life skill and the education program. The declining prevalence of HIV AIDS among adults from three person in 1997 to 0 0.5 person in 20, uh, 2020 made Cambodia become one of the few success stories in reversing the trend of uh, HIV AIDS epidemics. This is a it's uh, demonstrate uh, effective collaboration between Cambodia government, civil society and development partner have to turn the tides of epidemic together. And we cannot ignore that the success is not a part of our effort. But uh, HIV is not only the risk of young people and adults at the time. The norm cause difficulty to women to negotiate term of sexual activity, safe sex, and condom use in the context of different relationship. IPV prevalent is unacceptable high. It was up to 18%. Adolescent behavior on drug use, child marriage, STD, STI, gender inequality, situation, unintended pregnancy are still serious concern that we need to take in the adoption. Next slide, please. Uh, taking this opportunity that the, Royal, uh, that, that the Royal Government of Cambodia has made remarkable progress toward uh, the Millennium Development Goal and demonstrate the commitment to ensure that young people have access to the quality of education, without keeping admission to advocate for CSE in Cambodia. And this is an example of the other material that we summarize and make it into the advocacy tool. We, uh, we summarize uh, some uh, results that we advocate related to CSE. Next slide, please. A lot of work on the ground level. We start to engage adolescents and conduct sensitization workshop campaign on adolescent sexual and reproductive health in the community. We set up the evidence base, including the monitoring report on sexual and reproductive health education among young people and opinion of teacher in favor of the sexual reproductive health understanding and encouragement of the local authority. And then we uh, take it as a grant to uh, develop the evidence-based recommendation for improving the sexual reproductive health by review the, reviewing the national policy to identify gap and challenge 
in the process of promoting reproductive and sexuality health education. Of course, one of the irresistible reasons that uh, favor to uh, the improvement of CSE in Cambodia is the government open for participation of UN NGO in the process of policy development. RAC and other agency has been providing the opportunity to raise and explain the clearer language about comprehensive sexuality education at that time. We can count on the national population policy that is considered as one of the reference for the other ministry to develop their national policy strategy in line to the broader national population policy. In 2003, the first national population policy attaching the great importance to sustainable development and people well-being. The current one is from 20, uh, 2016 to 2013. Consider, and it considers the comprehensive sexuality education as the important step to promote health well-being. Next slide, please. To inter interpret the policy into the action, we require a lot of engagement from all other stakeholders. UN agency have a very important role in providing the technical assistance to the government and enable the NGO, CSO, and the government to work together. International commitment, national commitment to the ICPD program of action and the subsequent agreements contribute to more favorable environment for CSE2. In fact, the bilateral support that welcome financial support from the international agency for implementation adolescent health program and the implementation by both government and NGO have been actively processed across the country. One of the example in 1998, the European Commission provided a fund to UNFPA Cambodia, IPPF, and national NGO in Cambodia, including RAP, to start the first large-scale youth health program in school and out of school in promoting the sexual health education. Next slide, please. Having the budgets for implementation is not completely linked to the success. Technical expertise that require to ensure the standard of CSE within the contextual life process is very important after the national consideration on CSE in Cambodia. Uh, yes, of course, experts from IPPF and RSU work closely with RAP and the Ministry of Education. We bring international experience and good practice on CSE, sharing with partner work uh, together to establish the curriculum and develop the national textbook. Uh, next slide, please. The most appreciation to make official CSE happen is favor to senior official and official in the school health department of the Ministry of Education in Cambodia. Actually, there dedication to in advocate for integration of CSE as one of the component of the health education curriculum is an example. We work together to organize a lot of training, series of training, numbers of workshop, meeting to review the CSE textbook. Next slide, please. There are the first CSE textbook on life skill education, reproductive health, and sexual health, published in 2012 for grade 5 until grade 11, exclude grade 9 and grade 12. Next slide, please. In order to promote the CSE, that initiated the new project, uh, we uh, on the promoting sexual reproductive health on rice of school students through life skill education, comprehensive sexuality education from 2014 to 2016. We focus on Comfort Province and the project cover teachers, parents, local authority as our beneficiary. For example, the projects uh, cover 1,560 uh, teachers from eight districts. Uh, they have been trained CSE to use the CSE curriculum and 573 parents and 262 local authority uh, 
have been involved with uh, the CSE education as well. Next slide, please. These small projects can reach out a total 60, uh, uh, six, 6,188 students from 402 schools. They received the CSE session. And according to our evaluation project report, knowledge at issue among the young people, teacher, parent, and local authority have been changed. Uh, particular, particularly for the young people, they have greater knowledge of human development, the importance of friendship, the importance of schooling, retention, and so on. And as you can see here, only one year, the last year of the project attitude change related to sexual behavior improved from 81% to 93 in quarter four. And the same as teaching confidence that improved from 85% to 87%. And 75 of teacher agree that the training from that is very benefit for them. Next slide, please. To conclude the history of CSE in Cambodia, of course, it happened from the local action. The historical working result from 1990 that focused only the education on HIV prevention for young people has been growing up and influenced to the national formal practice and then lead to the commitment for the formal and uh, national standard. As I mentioned earlier, the life skill education on sexual and reproductive health, according to a group which is developed in 2012, it's just only an extra subject that not required to integrate into the school curriculum. A school across the country had different level of commitment in using the textbook according to, to their arrangement of schedule. Uh, by the way, in 2016, the Ministry of Education and now on Health Education subject for students is a compulsory subject. There are five six components in the subjects. Uh, it's the sexual and reproductive health is one of the components in the health education subjects. And of course, another partner is keeping our role to support and improve CSE in line with the international standard. And it's all one is one of the significant reference for us to use for uh, developing the textbook and curriculum as well. Next slide, please. Even we can see a lot of positive progress on CSE in Cambodia, we still have a long way to go to ensure that the CSE could be reached out to all adolescents in Cambodia. With our strong commitment, we work with our partner, including UNFPA Cambodia, we actively promote CSE not only in school, but also out of school. For in school, despite of supporting and assisting the national team, uh, to develop the textbook, we also provide the support in uh, conducting the TOT for the teacher grade, uh, grade 7 and grade 10 across the Comport province with 536 teachers. We continue to be a part of the process of uh, developing the curriculum for pre-service teacher education in the other state, with the other stakeholders as well. We also initiate to produce the video for grade seven and grade 10 to ensure that everyone can access to CSE education. And of course, we also uh, support to the establishment of uh, hair room in high school in the Port Bowen. And uh, we try to produce more material related to CSE, including adapting the uh, amazed video and the other uh, video that is possible for us to and benefit for the student in Cambodia. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, the next step for CSE in Cambodia, we need to work together. We can stand alone for advocating for CSE, but of course uh, we need from a little force. We work for consideration on CSE for improving the life skill and well-being. It's including the promoting rice approach. We need to eliminate all of CSE stigma and stereotype. And we need to work together with a strong commitment. So the first step that we have to do is to build up the capacity of teacher, educator, and roll out the textbook based on our plan. 
CSE is very important for everyone. It's not only for Cambodia, but we need to advocate for CSE as a global level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Somali. I think you ended on such a good note by saying that CSE is important for everyone. And you had a particular slide that talks about how CSE is also teaching us about life skills, negotiation skills, and how to say no. Those are actually skills that come so important in all aspects of life, whether you're looking for a job, deciding what kind of career you want to take on uh, all throughout your life. And I, was, I particularly noted also how you had come together with different stakeholders outside of um, Ministry of Education, different NGOs, and even um, peer educators so that you could reach out to young people, not just in schools, but also out of schools. There is a lot of work still to be done, but thank you very much for that presentation, for showing us how um, it can actually, we can actually take into consideration different practices on how to implement CSE effectively. Thank you, Dr. Somali. I'm going to introduce now the next panelist. If you recall, one of the findings that Brian and Brian shared with us was that there was a low satisfaction level about CSE across the different survey of respondents. It was only about 28% who thought that CSE was delivered very well or well in their local settings. And this number was even lower among the group of LGBTQIA people and also people with disabilities. And, but we actually have now a panelist who is going to talk to us about how we can have more inclusive CSE and how to, and how to have age and developmentally appropriate sexuality education for people with disability. For this topic, I'm happy to introduce Sira Ratu, who is a program manager for Reproductive and Family Health Association of Fiji. Hi, Sira. Sira has been working in 16, over, for over 16 years, advocating for sexual and reproductive health and rights for marginalized and vulnerable populations across Fiji. She's a strong advocate for children and young people, particularly young people living with disability. Sarah, Sira has also worked across Asia Pacific and with other IPPF member associations as a facilitator for sexuality and disability program development. Over to you, Sira. Excited to hear your presentation. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Natasha. Uh, next slide. A brief introduction about uh, Reproductive and Family Health Association of Fiji, uh, known as REF. We are a member association of the International Planned Parenthood uh, uh, Federation uh, under the ECO region. And for the project on disability, it was uh, funded by the Australian government that was uh, managed through Family Planning New South Wales. Uh, with uh, REF being the implementing partners where we work with uh, work in partnership and in collaboration with um, the disabled people's organization like the Fiji Association for the Deaf, uh, Spinal Injury, looking at the Psychiatric Survival Association and the United Blinds uh, People's Association. With the uh, project activities that uh, we did. It uh, included organizational adults audits of uh, REF's capacity to be disability inclusive. We did a baseline survey of uh, students and teachers in uh, uh, special schools where we design and deliver, design and to deliver uh, sexuality education for students with disabilities where we were also able to, to train uh, teachers. And also we were able to do an online survey of uh, students and teachers that, um, that attended uh, this survey. Thank you, Natasha. <clears throat> OK. 
Thank you, pressing Natasha. Natasha. With the purpose of, uh, okay. The purpose, uh, go back Natasha, please. With the purpose of this survey was to increase the exposure to comprehensive sexuality education for primary and secondary school students with disability in the special schools, and also to determine whether the project has uh, achieved its goal in increasing access to comprehensive sexuality education or CSE for people with disability in Fiji, where we looked at uh, topics on relationship, safety, puberty. Uh, we also looked at family planning and STIs and also how the, the teacher's attitude towards sexuality education for students with disability and their confidence and experience in teaching uh, CSE for children with disabilities. So when we did the, the survey, we found that there were good knowledge and also there was some poor knowledge in terms of the topics that we did uh, in terms of uh, relationship. We found that um, 66% of children, were, they were able to identify feelings that they were comfortable with, like whether they were happy, whether it was a good experience or good feelings they have. And 76.6% .6 could name one activity they can do with their peers, uh, whether it's telling stories or playing volleyball or just playing together as uh, children. And uh, looking at safety, 90% could name a feeling that was appropriate, whether they were angry, they were sad, or they want to run away in, in the sense of uh, how safe they were. And 83% could name someone they could talk to in terms of safety, whether it was a family member, it's a sister, a brother, a parent, or, or, their, or a teacher. And in terms of uh, poor knowledge about feelings, 100% could name at least one activity to do with a friend, but none could name positive feelings they have when they are with friends. And also 100% could name feelings appropriate when with someone is making them feel bad, but only 8% of them are able to name someone they could tell. So that is why when we were looking at the survey uh, with the coverage of the topics that we had, we were able to identify that there were less intervention of um, SRH, sexual and reproductive health topics with uh, children with disability, whether they were in school or they were out of school as well. Uh, next slide, please, Natasha. So the intervention that we did so that we were able to carry out the survey. We managed to get the approval from the Ministry of Education under the Special Education Unit. We were also able to inform sessions, to have information sessions conducted with teachers and parents so that they are aware of the content of uh, the sessions that we will take with the students and also the context of uh, the questions that we were going to ask the children the survey questions that we were going to use to interview uh, the students. And also the, you can see that there were parents that were that wants to be present when we were interviewing the, the students. So we were very open in the approach that we use so that everybody is, is involved, whether they are parents or they are teachers or they are member of the school in terms of the content of the survey and the sessions that, uh, that we have to undertake in the special, uh, special schools. Next, uh, Natasha. So we had a few highlights from the survey that we did and the project under the project that we did. Um, the REF staff improved skills and confidence in communicating with young people with a range of disabilities and also increased understanding of what students want to learn and what teachers feel is important. And uh, 
it uh, assists the draft to develop uh, comprehensive education programs that are relevant and accessible to students in special schools and to develop an appropriate professional development program for teachers and uh, two of uh, the ref staff with uh, stars. Uh, we authored the health journal that was published and the SAGE looking at sexuality education for primary school students with a disability in Fiji. Next uh, slide, uh, Natasha, please. Uh, some of the lessons uh, learned that we found uh, after doing the survey and the project, uh, there's been a lot of activities done, but uh, it would be wise that we have a memorandum of understanding signed with our partners that will be involved in the work that we do in terms of uh, disability. And um, another one is the resources. When we look at resources, we were looking at teachers that needs to be trained uh, specifically for children with disability. We need to have resources that are disability friendly. We need to have, uh, of course, funding for sustainability of uh, programs and also to, to buy the resources that are relevant for, for children with disabilities and also more capacity building in the areas of disability for, um, for teachers, whether you are a facilitator for SRH in uh, relation to disability. And also the last one is to have the right people. You need to talk to the right people so that you can get your work done. If we are going through people that cannot make decisions about the work that we do, then it will take longer process. So that's why it's always good to have MOUs and people that you can talk directly to in order for you to carry out the work that you need to, to implement whether it's on disability or humanitarian or any other work that we do. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Sierra. I like that the, your methodology or your approach to comprehensive sexuality education for persons with disabilities in Fiji, you actually involved also the parents a lot in, in, in the in testing out your approaches and methodology. And I think that this is also really a, um, an, an area that we can pick at as a wish list for what comprehensive sexuality education means. It's inclusive, inclusive for those that may have been um, traditionally, shall we say that, or usually left behind in previous programs like persons with disabilities, but also engaging um, the community in delivering these topics, which includes, of course, parents and teachers and other stakeholders. Thank you so much, Sierra. From that presentation to NPG, I'm going to take you to the Philippines, where um, we're going to have a presentation about delivering sexuality education in humanitarian settings. So this is another challenge where how do you deliver comprehensive sexuality education in humanitarian settings? Um, the Philippines is one of the most um, typhoon and disaster prone areas in the world. And um, apart, from, apart from natural disasters, there are also other humanitarian calamities and that the country faces. I will let Laura Joy Paragon introduce and talk about this more, it's just that the Philippines is my home country. So I'm sorry if I, if I talk so much about that, Laura, maybe I just missed the Philippines a bit. Let me first introduce you properly. Laura is a graduate of Bachelor of Arts in Communication Development at the Iloilo Science and Technology University. In 2013, Laura began her journey as a youth volunteer for the, plan, for the family planning organization of the Philippines. From there, she became a trained community-based screening motivator and peer educator. She's also one of the FPOP youth who have been involved in the emergency response team with 
with Typhoon Haiyan, which was at the time when the strongest typhoon recorded in the world when it hit the Philippines back in 2013. Presently, Laura is the National Youth Representative of FDOP. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, can I ask Natasha to present my slide for me, please? So, as mentioned by Anna, my presentation would talk about the delivery of top quality education and humanitarian settings here in the Philippines. Next slide, please. Thank you, Natasha. So, hi everybody. Again, I am Laura Zay Parabon, and thank you very much for giving us UP and the Bridge Trinity to be part of this event. Um, I am the current Youth Representative and Family Planning Organization of the Philippines, and I am a volunteer since 2013. My very first engagement in the MA was a sexual productive health response to Typhoon Haiyan for many communities in Panay Island who were affected by the typhoon. During the response, I was given the opportunity to facilitate the Usapan sessions, or the healthy education sessions, with the young people and even had the first hand experience providing assistance to medical students and providing medical interventions to communities. At the present, I am one of the youth volunteers as well who works closely with FTOP and four communities as part of FTOP's reproductive health, medical missions, and use the COVID 19 pandemic in the Philippines. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, FTOP is the family planning organization of the Philippines, a non stop, non government, and, and service oriented organization who, who aims to provide services to all, especially the vulnerable and the marginalized. We are a member association of the International Planned Parenthood Federation, and we have chapters in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. As mentioned by Anna, an average, the Philippines is visited by 30 typhoons a year. Around two to three of these typhoons can create damage to a sizable number of population and vulnerable communities. During the onslaught of these typhoons, families are displaced, public infrastructures are destroyed, resulting to either lack or limited access to government services. Adolescents as part of the population affected by these emergencies, the vulnerabilities, the sexual reproductive health issues become more pronounced, especially with the breakdown of their protective and nurturing structures. Their families, communities, schools, recreational outlets, and places of worship. Thus, the sexual reproductive health needs are largely unmet, resulting in higher incidence of adolescent pregnancies and sexual transmitted infections, including HIV among adults. Next slide, please. Thank you. Ensuring adolescent sexual reproductive health is critical in a humanitarian crisis. Yet, adolescents are often overlooked as a vulnerable group and from the sexuality education to be promoted and proactive emergencies to address young people's needs and aspirations. Because of the disrupted health, education, and protection services during emergencies, immediate response to address concerns should be done um, immediately. Training of youth volunteers and staff on how to effectively deliver sexuality education sessions while conducting humanitarian response to reproductive health medical measures. A challenge here is that during pandemic, young people ages 18 years old below are restricted to go out and cannot access to services. And during this time, limited numbers of beneficiaries since we need to abide with minimum health standards and physical distancing. It's very important to conduct assessment and and coordination meetings to LGUs to provide responsive response to the needs of the people and the communities. A conduct of monitoring and evaluation is important as well. Um, for us to be able to see what the community needs more, what assistance should be provided more, and where are they now? Um, the success story here is this, giving both information and services for young people and providing sexual reproductive information can raise public awareness, um, like teenage pregnancy, STI, HIV, and et cetera, 
also through conducting coordination meetings and reproductive health medical missions, it, um, it has important partnership between RGs, providing education and link the beneficiaries to such reproductive health services. So we are always doing this advocacy, translating it into services. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, FUP facilitated a three-month humanitarian response for survivors of typhoon Ruli by mobilizing the productive health medical mission. And Super Typhoon Ruli landed in the Deco region last um, um, November 2, 2020, amid the COVID pandemic. FUP teams have been a productive health medical mission extensively focused on providing sexual reproductive health information education and services to pregnant and lactating women, women of reproductive age, especially to young people. FTP has provided a range of sexual reproductive health services to communities. During the response, youth volunteers play a vital role in where they lead the comprehensive sexuality education sessions for their peers and the overall community addressing different issues such as warning signs during pregnancy and care for newborn babies, sexual reproductive health and family planning, HIV and STI age, and gender-based violence. Youth as a provider of sexual reproductive health services and during humanitarian response, we ensure that services provided to communities. Next slide, please. So we will see the numbers of the necessaries on the next slide. Thank you. Despite of the COVID-19 resistance in the um in, in the typhoon Uni response, the three humanitarian response program through the implementation of MISP and sexual reproductive health, a total of 1,759 clients from the marginalized factory, 747 were um were young people treated aged 10 to 24 years old, and also 1,012 are 25 and above treated with services. FTP able to distribute 6,240 IEC materials and COVID-19 and sexual productive culture, which plays a crucial role in demand generation and increased knowledge in life-saving services and how to mitigate transmission of COVID-19. The reproductive health medical missions also resulted in 1,874 family planning services to family planning accessories. 746 pregnant women were provided with antenatal care services, and also 828 mothers who diseases were provided postnatal care services. And the total of 117 young people, females, and young male, 31, also received sexual reproductive health consultation and counseling services. So this number doesn't lie. This number says that um, humanitarian response plays a vital role during humanitarian action. Next slide, please. <clears throat> to conduct a health information session handled by youth volunteers as part of the medical missions during the humanitarian response has provided a chance for young people to learn about CSE and teaching the majors to address the high incidence of teen pregnancy in the area. It has also helped parents who attended health education to become knowledgeable about the proper guidance of their adolescent children, especially on how to become sexually responsible. And according to a 20 year old female who wants to become who wants access to services of SUP during the retirement month and became a uh, provider of education on CSE, according to her. During the medical mission with the SUP and ITPS, I have learned a lot of things that, that changed my perspective about life. I learned that even though all of us experience the same disaster, we do not experience the same level of its effect. Some might have it easy but some might not. And missing myself among all the beneficiaries of the medical mission also has me grow and turn from an introvert into a person who is open to all people who need help. So that's very reality from the young person of SPOP. 
Next slide, please. As we want to improve the CSA implementation, we should include the implementation of CSA to young people who cannot afford to attend schools and ensuring that all young people, I'm going to give a stress on all, all young people have access to, F, to CSA in all levels, community and school levels. Inclusion of CSA and sexual productive health in um, BIR plans and allotting funds and budgets for the activities. And ensuring sexual productive health and CSE should be implemented by a specific government agency that should focus on its implementation. And lastly, as we always say in, um, in the event station, nothing about us without us. Involvement of young people and youth groups it is important to these programs. As a first factor, um, this is a lesson learned from, from me now, as a first factor in delivering sexuality education during humanitarian settings are the youth volunteers and the in-depth involvement of the program. When content to sexuality education um, sessions is handled by youth, youth volunteers as part of the medical mission during the humanitarian response, it is provided a chance for young people to learn about CSP and contribute in addressing the high incidence of teen pregnancy and the reduction of other issues in the area. So I think that's the end of my presentation. I really thank you, everybody, for listening to me and this the contact number of the SAP. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Laura, for your presentation. I think it was also what resonated a lot, I think, with, with some of with what you were saying was how, yes, it may be difficult to access, even more access comprehensive sexuality education during humanitarian settings, but there was also an opportunity to translate advocacy into services and engage peer volunteers, which you had highlighted as a success factor in delivering or continuing to deliver comprehensive sexuality education in humanitarian settings. All right, everyone, we still have one more presentation. We're going a little bit over time, but I know that this is a topic that is so important to all of us here. So that we have one more presentation and I hope to take you through that. But before I do that, there is a question from the audience from Siang Ching Cheng Lim about what are the topics that young people wanted to have or to include in comprehensive sexuality education. So what was on their wish list? And thank you, Brian, for answering, Brian and Brian, and let me just read that out. So according to the survey that was taken by the UNFPA in 2019 across over 1,400 young people ages 15 to 24 in Asia Pacific, the most commonly taught topics for human body and development. So these were topics related to puberty, menstruation, anatomy, and then supported or followed by other topics such as STI prevention, HIV and AIDS, birth control and contraception and pregnant early or mistimed pregnancy prevention. However, young people wished that they had learned more about sexuality and the concepts or how it lends to concepts of healthy relationships. So they wish they had more information about sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, so SOGI, sexual abuse, gender equality, violence and harassment, contraception, menstruation, marriage, relationships, and family. Thank you, Siang, for your question. Now we have one more presentation from Jack Martin. Jack, I'm going to introduce you, but let me first talk about the topic that you're going to bring to the panel today. We talked about the different limitations and challenges of comprehensive ed sexuality education and its delivery, the pushback against it, the, the difficulty in delivering it in difficult settings like natural disaster or humanitarian settings. But you'll be talking to us about digital learning platforms as an opportunity to deliver CSE and engage learners who have difficulty attending conventional classroom training. 
Jack, I'm really excited to hear your presentation. Let me introduce you formally. You are the program office. Jack is a program officer for youth and CSE for IPPF, ESR sub-regional office for the Pacific. He is based in Fiji and he is very passionate about development programs for children and young people. This is an area he has been working in for over 17 years and his experience has vast experience in the areas of youth development, adolescent sexual health and child rights. Jack works across the Pacific region with Pacific Island governments and civil society organizations. Over to you, Jack. Um, thank you, Natasha. If I can have my presentation. Okay, so today I'll be talking about one of the solutions to um, digital solutions to comprehensive sexuality education that IPPF has been exploring in the uh, East Southeast Asia and Oceania region. And um, we're happy to pilot um, to develop in the Pacific. Uh, the program is currently supported by Australian Aid and uh, in fact, through the New Zealand Foreign Affairs and Trade. Next, please. So as previously, people have mentioned comprehensive sexuality education. Um, I'll just take you back just to put into perspective. It's a, obviously it's a curriculum. Uh, it looks at addressing cognitive, emotional, physical and social aspects of uh, sexuality. It also aims, the aim is to, to address um, the needs of young people, uh, particularly with knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values that kind of look at health, uh, well-being, and dignity of young people. So whilst, whilst we do look at um, sex, sexuality and there's a connotation that it's uh, associated to, to sex, it, it looks beyond that and it looks at you know, mental health, and it looks at other issues, not just around um, sexual health. And it helps young people through the stages uh, as they go into puberty and they progress into um, adolescence. Uh, currently, you'll will find, uh, particularly in the uh, Asia region, uh, we also find that uh, Asia and Pacific region that most of the curriculum around CSE is delivered face-to-face. -face. Uh, it's either in school or in the out-of-school setting with young people in various populations at community level. Importantly, comprehensive sexuality education looks at some of the SDGs and it looks particularly at uh, education it looks at health and it looks at uh, gender equality. Next, please. Uh, so with the background of sexuality education, there was also a number of challenges that kept popping up, particularly in the Pacific. Uh, there was you know, in the Pacific, there's a wide demographic disbursement of islands. So lots of islands spread across the very, very big uh, ocean. Uh, it is, it's a quite a big span. And whilst young people across the Pacific in almost all countries in the Pacific now, um, there's a very high increase in uh, youth population. In some of the countries, it's as high as 65% that are under the age of 30. And so with this, big youth population spread across a very, very uh, large span in the Pacific. There was also a challenge of um, conducting face-to-face -face trainings because of remoteness uh, as well. And another key challenge was it's, it's very costly uh, to go and cover uh, these areas, the high costs associated with, with the face-to-face -face, uh, model that that is available. Um, with that 
as well when we saw COVID come in two years ago, COVID really affected and there was a lot of restrictions, the movements uh, currently in the Pacific as well. Now we're facing some of the countries have gone into their first wave and second wave. And so the restrictions have really increased and that has, has also limited the face-to-face -face interaction for, for CSE. We also saw that in Asia region as well in a big way uh, COVID really affected the engagement, face-to-face um, -face engagements. And so, so that has played out into to why we've decided to really come up with a digital solution to take uh, CSE online. Next, please. Next slide, please. So what is this uh, comprehensive sexuality online a program that I'm making reference to. Uh, one of the speakers spoke earlier. Uh, one of the uh, speakers mentioned um, Cambodia. Cambodia using the Cambodia using the it's all one curriculum and the eight modules for that has been adapted to to this online uh, platform. The platform is also flexible. So it's young people can come on, it's developed for young people. They can come on and it's at their own learner space. So the eight modules they can go through as they, they feel they can go. Um, currently we have a server in-house in IPPF then that can host up to 20 to 40,000 users with an ability to, to expand. So there's a capacity to, to host a big number of uh, young people also, um, pool of moderators, there's a pool of moderators uh, um, attached to the course to support learners. And it's also accessible on computer as well as a smartphone. So the app is also available on a smartphone and young people can connect to it. Next slide, please. Uh, with the pilot, happening, we're, we're proposing to pilot with a number of young people across selected countries. And then we're looking at a full rollout across Asia Pacific, and then continue to expand the, uh, this is supporting the expansion of CSE, as well as provision of uh, accreditation. So whilst we're offering the course, we're also trying to, to make sure that the level of the course, it's, it's uh, accredited and young people can use the certification as well as as a certificate level four or um, by doing the course. I think what I'll do now is I'll just quickly take everyone into the, the platform and show you. Just quickly show you the platform. So once young people are given access and they're registered, uh, this is the landing landing page. They'll have a username and then have a password and they can log in. So once they log in, it just takes them to the uh, page and the, the units are there. Uh, each unit also has the UNESCO standard video for each page will have the standard uh, UNESCO. It's just a reminder of the CSC. What is CSC? Um, we've also had different uh, young people from the different countries to introduce the topics. So for the introduction, we have someone from Tuvalu. And once you go into each unit, it opens and then it, it takes, it takes uh, there's an introduction from a young person as well. And the video can be played. And so the, the topics are there and young people can access it. Um, the learning notes are there, the learning outcomes, it has a grocery. They're not familiar with some words, the grocery is there. Um, if they're not sure, they can prop and ask questions, help I'm lost and someone from the pool of moderators will respond. And there's a discussion forum. So at the, as you can see on the right, it's just a small pre-test. There's four questions and a post-test and a forum. 
so you, um, young people can will post a topic, just one topic, and young people can contribute to it. The pre-test and post-test shows the knowledge before and after the, they get into the unit, and the discussion forum shows us participation of uh, young people. And once they finish one module, it'll give them a badge. You have to finish unit one before unit two will, will open. That's how the course is, is designed. And once you do the eight units, then you'll get a certificate at the end of the course. Yes, yeah, so, so that's basically how the, the modules are, are made. The modules also have, the units also have a video. So with each video, there's a video that plays, they can watch it, they can read the notes. Um, with the notes also, it's important with the notes, we've also uh, have a plug and play. So most young people we know now, they're on their uh, um, smartphones and you know they're not really reading stuff, but they're listening. So they can play, just press play. And so the notes can be read through just a plug and play. And so we've kept the notes in Word as well as the plug and play uh, feature. I, I think I'll, I'll stop there and I'll hand over back to, to Anna. Thank you, Jack. Thank you so much. You're absolutely right that young people now are just on the phones, on their phones or on their laptops. And so that's exactly where we also need to be when delivering comprehensive sexuality education. Thank you very much for sharing that app and how we plan to do this. Thank you so much. We have a question from the audience. Thank you for, for putting in your questions, please. We have a few more minutes. If you have other questions, please type them into the chat. This is a safe space where we can all talk about our own experiences or thoughts and also questions that we may have about comprehensive sexuality education. There's a question here about, is there any experience of conducting CSE training for male or female separately? How is the effectiveness compared with the mixed different gender groups? Laura, shall I just read out your response? Thank you very much to Laura from FPOP Philippines, who's given a response. It is more effective to discuss CSE by batch, according to their gender, their age, for example. It is effective to discuss appropriately. Like girls, things, subjects can be discussed more about menstruation and their concerns can be catered immediately. We usually divide young people according to their age and gender to discuss appropriate topics. I think, Laurie, you're talking about age-appropriate comprehensive sexuality education and also delivering comprehensive sexuality education that's um, more of the concern of the different groups. So this has been your experience. Thanks very much for answering that. Sira has also given a response. Sira says, with my experience, it really depends. When we have separate trainings, they're more open to ask questions concerning both sexes and other genders as well. When we have combined it, it is more broad in the sense of types of questions asked and how they can share more information as well. But it really depends on how you run the session as the facilitator. Thanks, Sira, for also bringing up that point about how the facilitator can also influence the kind of interaction also among the group and how that can also help facilitate different kinds of discussions. I think we can all try to have different types of sessions and see what works for us, but always getting the feedback of our learners and young people. Oops, I think there is Okay, thank you, Suyi. I thought there was one more question. I wanted to make sure that we got in the questions. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us. I, I was writing down so many notes about comprehensive sexuality education from the survey that was presented by UNFPA and IPPF. 
And I was also taking down notes from the different presentations across countries, Cambodia, Fiji, Philippines, about how we can deliver comprehensive sexuality education across different settings and to different groups. And I was thinking, comprehensive sexuality education, what does it mean? When we talk about comprehensive, it also means inclusive. So including um, persons with disabilities and LGBT people who in the survey said that they feel like their needs and their questions may be left out in, in current curriculum. And then sexuality. Sexuality is so much more than just biological aspects of sex. It is also about the body and the autonomy of your body and your ability to make decisions about your body, but also the relationships that you have with other people, the intimate relationships that you have. And lastly, education. I love so much about how an argument for CSE, and we've seen that across the different settings, was that um, it is actually a way to empower young people to think critically about decisions that they make and also to assert themselves when it comes to um, bodily autonomy, but also to have to respect, um, to have respect and consent present in also our decisions and in relating to one another. There's a comment here about Leah from Leah Sitia who says creating safe space is also an important component in teaching CSE. Absolutely. And we hope we have been successful in creating a safe space here this morning in this forum. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Um, I would just like to say that also I heard so much respect consent, inclusivity in all the different presentations. And I think that's the biggest um, rallying call for why we need comprehensive sexuality education. The pandemic has shown us that the quality of our relationships so much enrich our lives. And when we have respectful, healthy relationships, which is also something that comprehensive sexuality can teach us, it contributes to our well-being and our happiness. Comprehensive sexuality education empowers us for life. And as we also said, it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation that needs to be taught early on and it's an ongoing process. So young people who are here, older people like me who are here, we keep on continuing to learn about comprehensive sexuality education. We have to keep on talking about sex and sexuality and keep on making it inclusive. Are there any last, may, may, may I call on the speakers and the panelists? If there are any last um, comments or thoughts and insights that you may want to share. And then I'll go over to Tomoko for closing. If there are none, I am so happy to have been, and I'm so privileged to have been able to moderate this panel for all of you. Thank you to everyone for joining us for our lesson, uh, this panel on comprehensive sexuality education and delivering inclusive and resilient CSE to young people. We all are here to, with a shared goal of learning and protecting and respecting and empowering young people to make choices that are right for them. Tomoko, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Anna. And there was a chat in the that really appreciated your great moderation today, but it really was very nice and inclusive. And I think we had a very rich sharing and um, learning session today. Uh, as have been mentioned, we are living in a challenging and fast changing world, um, but I really like the different perspectives that were brought together today and it helped us to enrich our thinking. And I hope that we take back all these uh, lessons learned, little, little things you've heard today that would really help you to think of what you're doing back in your work in, in your respective places. And I hope that we have at least one or two take home points that will help us to better shape our intervention and this, all of our work will then help to better shape the lives of young people in our respective countries. 
So thank you so much once again for joining and thank you, Anna. Thank you to all the speakers for taking time and sharing today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all those who are watching live. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.